Hi, I'm Bob Kolb, Professor of Finance here at Loyola University, where I also hold the Frank W. Considine Chair of Applied Ethics. And joining me today is Rob Bliss from Wake Forest University. Uh, Rob holds the F. Uh, M. Kirby Chair in Business Excellence at Wake Forest in the Business School there. And Rob has had a long and distinguished career in derivatives, and he's also a specialist in insolvency and bankruptcy risk. Uh, Rob earned his PhD in finance from the University of Chicago and has also worked as a research economist at the Federal Reserve Bank of Atlanta, the Federal Reserve Bank of Chicago, and the Bank of England. So Rob, we're, we're very glad uh, you could join us today to talk about okay. insolvency, bankruptcy, and other unpleasantness in uh, the world of derivatives. Mm -hmm. And uh, as we'll be explaining to our audience, uh, there really is pretty different system in derivatives compared to other uh, uh, kinds of industries. Mm -hmm. But maybe we could start off by my asking you to briefly explain how uh, bankruptcy works, say, in regular commercial enterprises. Well, in, in regular bankruptcy, regular corporate bankruptcy, which would apply to uh, the uh, now defunct investment banks uh, and most corporations and uh, insurance companies, the, the first thing that happens is what is called a stay or a timeout is placed on the creditors, which prevents them from uh, seizing assets and um, basically making it impossible for the firm to continue business. So the foundation of bankruptcy law is this process of a stay. Following that, the courts go through a, a, a lengthy process of deciding who's going to get what uh, in the uh, resolution of the bankruptcy. Right. So, so the function of the stay is to prevent the creditors from forcing the firm to cease operations. Exactly. If you think about it, if, if an airline uh, was to file for bankruptcy, as they have done several times, and the uh, creditors were allowed to take away the airplanes, there would be no airlines. Uh, so uh, as we've seen, the airlines have gone through bankruptcy, the stays have been imposed on those, and they've continued operations. Right. And uh, the social role of that sort of regime is to keep people working, keep services being provided, keep, in the case of manufacturing, keep things being produced while the, uh, the details of the bankruptcy are worked out. That's true. And an, an additional uh, reason for doing that is to maximize the value of the firm's assets. If you dismember the firm uh, and uh, then sell the assets uh, simply to satisfy your own claims, uh, the net proceeds of that process are going to be considerably less than if you keep the firm intact and uh, realize what's called the going concern value. Right. Well, we've all had experience in this economy with doing business with firms in bankruptcy, and uh, it's hard to tell uh, you know, which airline is in bankruptcy at the moment because things exactly. proceed pretty much with the same wonderful service, whether it's in bankruptcy at the moment or not. Mm -hmm. But as we turn now to uh, the world of derivatives, there's a completely different regime at work for, for handling such matters. And maybe you could begin by giving us an overview and then we'll drill down to some of the uh, more specific okay. features. It's very interesting, uh, both in the United States and in the major developed countries, uh, the derivatives industry, and by derivatives I'm talking about uh, options, futures, and swaps, and not so much about uh, the uh, securitizations that we've heard so much about today. Uh, but the derivatives industry has argued for and gotten exemptions from the stay that applies in normal bankruptcy that allow uh, the derivatives counterparties, the parties to the der these derivatives contracts in the event of a default or insolvency to uh, do what is impossible uh, normally in a bankruptcy. To wit, they can uh, seize the assets, they can uh, and not the assets, but they can seize what's called the collateral that, that has been posted. Um, they can terminate their contracts, which would not be possible uh, for, say, uh, if you had a supplier uh, to an airline that's supplying oil, has a long-term contract to supply oil, they can't decide on the event of a bankruptcy to stop doing so. Uh, but you can with derivatives. And the last thing that does usually apply in some jurisdictions uh, but is not important in normal bankruptcy is the concept of netting, where when you have multiple contracts between a creditor and an insolvent firm, the ability to offset the obligations under more than one contract and, there, and then generate an obligation for the difference rather than for the uh, 
uh, what's called the gross amounts. Right. And are we talking here mainly about the over-the-counter market, or is, uh, are all the points you're making, do they apply to exchange-traded derivatives as well? With exchange-traded derivatives, uh, a lot of what we're going to talk about with the over-the-counter market happens automatically. So uh, because your counterparty in the exchange-traded derivatives is a single institution and not the firm that you originally did the trade with. Uh, so netting happens uh, automatically. Uh, collateral is handled um, in a similar way, actually. Um, and uh, closeout is uh, also handled under the rules of the, of the exchange. Right. And, and, and those are protected by law as well. Right. With the exchange-traded derivatives, we have this system of margining. and It's really kind of a, a whole different ball of wax maybe for, for another day to talk about that. Um, what about closeout? I think that's sort of like a third leg. We have the, the, uh, the netting, collateral, and closeout. Closeout is, is actually the one that is uh, unique uh, in the following sense. The um, netting occurs sometimes in commercial contracts. It's very rare. Usually one firm will be selling a product, another firm will be buying the product, and you don't have situations where there are, are multiple contracts in different directions between firms. But when that happens, for instance, if you have a mortgage at the bank and a deposit at the bank and the bank fails, um, the deposits that are not paid, the uninsured deposits, can be offset against the value of your mortgage. So that would be an example where that happens uh, uh, in a normal uh, non-derivatives context. Uh, uh, secured secured uh, contracts are, are equivalent to collateral. Uh, a car loan is secured by the value of the loan. So that happens in commercial contexts as well. Uh, but what does not happen and what is unique is the uh, ability of counterparties in a derivatives contract when there is an event of default to terminate the contracts. And that, uh, that's very special. It turns out that um, that is the critical leg of the three. The three, netting, collateral, and closeout, all work together. Uh, the arguments that were uh, advanced for why this is necessary basically focused on um, uh, on, on the importance of closeout, but what makes closeout so critically important is the economic effects of netting and collateral. Right. So we have a, uh, really two completely different uh, bankruptcy or insolvency regimes here. L we could say we have one for commercial enterprises, uh, like airlines, and this completely different one for derivatives. Uh, and if you think about the justification for those differences, that may be different than the way in which they actually work in terms of the uh, the commercial enterprise. So wh why have these kind of differences been granted for the derivatives industry? I mean, what's the justification or, or uh, rationale that's advanced for that? Yeah. Um, the treatment of derivatives uh, actually is, is what's called a carve-out to the, to the bankruptcy regime. So, but once the derivatives have been treated uh, and, and closed out and netted, the, any remaining obligations uh, go back into the normal bankruptcy regime. So this is within the context of the bankruptcy regime. The argument for why derivatives should be treated differently than almost all other contracts um, has to do with the perception that derivatives uh, pose a, um, a particularly high degree of systemic risk for the financial system. And therefore, if we had, uh, did not have these protections for derivatives and a large firm went into insolvency then we could have major, uh, major financial problems. Um, can I elaborate a little bit on that? Yeah, I mean we're, th that's really uh, sort of the ultimate point of uh, some of the work that you've done that that we want to get to. It is, and and it's it's ironic that uh, that when you when you drill down into this, you find that uh, the the pr the arguments for the protection were the systemic risk and the systemic risk it turns out arises because of the protections. And, and, th and this circularity uh, is intriguing. Uh, let me go back to netting. Right. I think it'd be really good if we go through netting, collateral, and closeout, and then okay. so how, show how that whole system works and leads to this exactly. paradox, if you will, between the fear of systemic risk and maybe what actually causes okay. systemic risk to potentially arise. Uh, financial firms, unlike, unlike most firms, uh, generate 
of thousands of contracts between uh, pairs of counterparties, particularly between big derivatives dealers. Now, when you allow netting, then what matters in terms of losses in the event of default of your counterparty is your net exposure. So let me give you an example. You owe me uh, $100 under an FX swap. I owe you $90 under a, a credit default swap. The net difference is $10. Now, if you were to go become bankrupt, I would apply to the bankruptcy court for my $10, but I would not owe the $90. It's, it's the $10 that matters. What becomes very interesting is if you owe me uh, $1,000, and I owe you $990, the difference again is $10. Or we could scale it up by increasing factors. So with netting, the credit risk is tied to the net amount and not to what's called the gross amount. Now, when firms' credit risk is tied to the net, that means they have to hold capital against the net, but not against the gross. This has enabled firms, dealer firms, to become very, very large. They do that on, a, on a, a fairly small capital base simply by managing their net exposures and then growing their gross exposures. Right, so you know, if you just take every contract, uh, derivatives contract that a large uh, derivatives house might have and you add up all those gross positions, the number would be absolutely staggering. But then if you mm -hmm. compare that total gross position to their net position, it can be a staggering reduction in the actual exposure. Exactly, and then they hold capital against a smaller net amount. But it turns out that the firms are, uh, as, we're, as we've seen in the last couple of months, uh, are systematically important, not so much because of the net amounts that are at risk, but because of the potential disruption due to the gross amounts of the contracts that get closed out when they um, get into insolvency. Right, you know, I suppose also the uncertainty of, about what that, their positions really are. And, and if you think about it, that was one of the arguments. If you have a situation where, um, that we go back to the $100 that you owe me and the $90 that I owe you and we have a $10 difference, if we got in a situation in the bankruptcy court where the bankruptcy court stayed us, stayed those contracts, bankruptcy can take years well, your hundred dollars that you owe me, if in a financial uh, market, could balloon into five hundred dollars, and the ninety dollars I owe you could uh, shrink to forty dollars. In the meanwhile, you know I have uh, protected myself against with collateral on that ten dollar exposure. But once you go into bankruptcy, I can't manage that protection, and so the ten dollars is meaningless because of the volatility and the value of the assets. This is different. If, if I borrow $100 million to build an office tower, the value of that office tower is not going to change radically uh, in the next year or 18 months. Right. It, you know, I think it'd be really good to give the audience some ideas to the scale of this differential between, uh, between the net position and the, the gross position. I think. Uh, in the recent past, some of the uh, bankruptcies and the credit crisis are, provide really interesting material for that. This, this, uh, this problem uh, was brought home. Um, Bear Stearns uh, did not go into bankruptcy and it, it wasn't triggered. And I'll come back to Bear Stearns in a minute. Lehman Brothers did. And the, the estimates of Lehman Brothers' gross positions, that's the number of contracts that were terminated on the Monday morning after they filed, uh, for bankruptcy is on the order of 20 to 25 trillion dollars, which is an uh, inconceivably large amount. The net exposures, that is the direct credit losses to counterparties in the market, were on the order of one or two hundred billion dollars. So that's a ratio of more than a hundred to one. Right. So l maybe the net exposure might be one percent of the gross exposure or, or even less potentially. It could. Yes, right. And the average of those is uh, is on the order of three percent across the entire entire system. Dealers are a little bit more con concentrated. Right. So when you see a lot of these numbers reported about the size of the derivatives industry, there they're a little misleading if you don't really understand this how netting 
uh, works and, and the actual reduction in exposure it implies. That's an interesting uh, issue. The, the size of the derivatives industry is about $500 trillion. Um, and you're absolutely right that uh, the net is much, much smaller than that. But there, there are two problems involved in the derivatives industry. One is when the counterparty defaults, okay, um, am I going to get paid on my net amount? $200 billion is still a lot of money for Lehman counterparties. Most of that was collateralized. That's one problem, credit risk. But the other problem is uh, that when there is a default, all the canceled contracts, all the closed out contracts have to get replaced. Not all of them, but the vast majority of them because they are serving purposes to provide minimal net exposures for other dealers. Right. Uh, so uh, everybody has to go in and kind of reposition themselves. Now, if you're talking about $20 trillion of contracts that need to be replaced, that is going to be very disruptive in a market, particularly in markets like we're seeing today when everybody is uncertain about which party to go to to replace their contracts. Right. Well, th this whole uh, netting and the reduction in capital required to hold big positions has, has led to a certain phenomenon in the industry, like a, a pretty uh, high levels of concentration. Maybe you could explain how that has come about. Well, and this is what, uh, what makes firms like uh, Bear Stearns and Lehman and Merrill uh, systemically important. Because firms uh, need to hold capital against their net exposures and not their gross exposures, uh, you can build a very, very large gross ex portfolio uh, on a very small capital base. Now, there are certain economies of scale that apply in derivatives dealings that, um, that lead to this concentration that would not happen unless you had the ability to only hold capital against, against the net. Uh, if you couldn't hold capital against the net, had to hold some kind of capital against your gross exposures, uh, Lehman Brothers would not have been as big as it is, nor would J.P. Morgan, and, and that the, the uh, market would be much less concentrated, and then the failure of, of any one of these smaller firms would have been much less important. Right, so part of your argument here is that because of netting, it allows firms to become enormous, achieve great economies of scale, and become, or at least approach, uh, a size that, that the uh, authorities will ultimately judge, quote, too big to fail, as the saying goes. Uh, well, not ultimately. Oh, right. it's, it's happened. Well, some are too big. Others of apparently similar size turned out not to be too big, as, as it's sorted uh, out. They, they did do the experiment with the two different firms. Right. And yes. I think yes. they uh, decided that perhaps the uh, uh, might have been better to bail them both out. Right. Well, like in your example of Lehman Brothers, uh, you mentioned that the net exposure was less than 1% of the gross exposure. You said it was mm -hmm. about $200 billion. But uh, that doesn't mean that uh, 200 billion of losses were suffered at all when uh, Lehman failed, because you also mentioned that a lot of that was collateralized. Right. And so that kind of brings us to the next of the three legs with collateral. Exactly, um, and, and and it may also explain why they let Lehman fail. The um, Bear Stearns failed very very quickly, and um, in in a matter of days. And it was interesting that when uh, when uh, J.P. Morgan agreed on, on the Sunday to, to purchase Bear Stearns or the part of Bear Stearns that was not uh, put into this uh, special fund that was funded by the Fed, the, uh, one of the clauses in that agreement to buy was a, a guarantee of all of Bear Stearns derivatives contracts to prevent the closeout happening. Lehman Brothers was smaller, uh, not smaller, it was actually larger but slower. And uh, so it failed over a period of a couple weeks and the counterparties were able to extract collateral uh, apparently in anticipation of this failure so that by the time uh, Lehman Brothers failed it had no collateral left. It, it had all been stripped out of the, out of the company. Um, so the, in this case where there was a sufficiently slow uh, evolution the markets were able to adapt. But they did still run into uh, problems and disruptions in trying to replace the contracts. Right. Okay, well that brings us to closeout, and uh, I guess there are really two kinds of contracts that you've uh, identified, executory and non-executory. So maybe you could explain 
how those differ, and then the role of closeout and especially a systemic risk. Right. The, um, the, uh, an executory contract is a contract uh, for an agreement to do something in the future. And a, a typical example would be uh, a forward contract where we simply agree that we're going to, I'm going to buy 100 ounces of gold from you in uh, December of next year for $900 an ounce, and we shake hands on it, and nothing happens until December of next year. Um, that would be an executory contract. So today, there's been no consideration other than an agreement. Um, when those contracts are closed out, uh, what happens is the contract is terminated, but we uh, have to value, uh, ascertain the value of the contract at the time it was terminated. And then we have a, an obligation uh, based on the value of this contract. Uh, a non-executory contract would be something like a loan. All right, where one party has already made a payment, the lender has, has lent the money, and now the borrower is under obligation to make payments. Uh, what typically happens in the case of, of those contracts, in the event of default, uh, there's what's called an acceleration of payments under the contract. So if I'm, if I'm a borrower and I default on a loan, the principal is due immediately. Right? Whereas if I had been paying my coupons regularly, it might not be due for 20 years. Mm -hmm. uh, so both of those uh, methods are used for closing out and terminating executory and non-executory contracts. Where that becomes a problem in a systemic risk situation, we need to go back to the concept of stays. Uh, the purpose of a stay is to call a timeout and do an orderly, careful, considered resolution of the firm that is in insolvency. But by allowing the closeout to happen, when you have firms like uh, Lehman Brothers or Merrill Lynch or, or that that are, have very large derivatives books, allowing the closeout means that you are able to, uh, the counterparties are able to take the collateral out, strip the assets out, terminate the contracts that were the business of the firm that was in insolvency, and it becomes impossible for a court to uh, then continue to run it the way they run airlines. It's like running the airlines without the airplanes. Right. It, yeah. There's no slowing down. Everything happens in, in a rush. It, and it happens within a day. Right. And, and I also there are these uh, cross-default clauses which uh, stimulate uh, much more activity in the closeout. So explain how the cross-default works and uh, well, features in this. Well, it, it's, it's an interesting uh, concept. The, the, uh, the contracts, these, they're called master agreements between uh, derivatives counterparties, have a number of, of reasons for termination. The most obvious is you don't make a payment under the contract. But if you think about it, uh, nobody is going to default on a contract in which they are owed money. People tend to default on contracts where they owe someone else money. But uh, if you have uh, uh, Lehman Brothers not paying Merrill, all right, but still receiving money from Citi, Citi may think that maybe this is not a good sign. Right. And so what they write into their contracts is, uh, if you default on payments to us, we terminate. If you default on payments to anyone else, we terminate, because that becomes a an event of default that signals that the counterparty has various serious financial problems. Right. So A and B have a contract. B and C have a contract. B defaults on a payment to C. A says, wait a minute, that constitutes a default but on the contract with me between A and B. Yeah, because I wrote it in the contract that we have. Right. That's the cross-default clause. Exactly. And so we're, I'm closing out everything. So if B misses one payment anywhere in the system, then everything is going to uh, cascade down in terms of being closed out with them. It's important to note that, uh, one, there's certain reasonableness involved. If, if, you know, a check gets lost in the mail, we don't have the collapse of a firm. Um, and close out is at the option of the solvent counterparty. So uh, we, we had uh, very rapid close outs uh, in the case of, of Lehman. Uh, in the case of um, of Bear Stearns, the, there was a change of control, which would have been probably a, a, a closeout, or I'm sorry, an event of a default. Uh, 
um, that could have triggered, but the counterparties in that case had the option not to close out, and because they were better off with J.P. Morgan guaranteeing than Bear Stearns guaranteeing, they did not close out. So there is an option. Uh, the close out itself is an option. Right, but they, they can demand. And what will happen is uh, if other people, if when you have hundreds of, of counterparties or, then, uh, and one of them decides to close out, then you, you tend to have a run for the exits. Right. And all these things work together, the netting, the collateral, the they closeout. Do. So for example, if you can't close out, then you can't really seize the collateral. And so the collateral doesn't really serve much of a function if you can't actually access it when your, your counterparty defaults. Right. Uh, the, the right to seize collateral is, is uh, treated specially under the bankruptcy code. Um, and uh, that's key. Um, it's, it's actually the closeout, that, the absence of closeout would make collateral useless because I collateralize my current exposures to you. If I couldn't close out my positions, uh, then my current exposures are going to change in the future, but a firm in bankruptcy is not going to post additional collateral. So what, what good is collateral if it could change, if, if my exposure can change, but I can't change my collateral? Right, so just to kind of summarize the general picture and then we'll get you know, focus in, the, in our conclusion on the, uh, the role of closeout and systemic risk, we have a, uh, an industry that's become very concentrated because of netting. Uh, and then we have a feature of, call, of closeout that can cause uh, enormous disruption throughout the major, major companies in the event of a perhaps rather small default in one sector of the market. And so you have an interaction then between the structure of bankruptcy uh, rules and laws mm -hmm. for derivatives and systemic risk. So maybe you could kind of uh, summarize that for us. Well, netting, if it works, allows the development of very, very big firms. Netting would not work unless you were able to close out at the current market values of the positions when your counterparty uh, went into bankruptcy. So closeout is important to making netting work, but closeout also, uh, when you have very large uh, gross positions, means that uh, there is a, a, a big disruption in the market when a major dealer defaults. If, does that, if that makes sense. Yeah, of course, yes. You need the closeout for the netting, but the closeout and the netting produces very big positions, but the closeout of very big positions becomes a systemic event. Right. I mean, you didn't use this term, but it, it is kind of a paradox that um, the very features that uh, made, this, made the concentration bring the systemic yeah. risk to it, and then the fear of systemic risk is the rationale for this very special kind of regime of, of bankruptcy rules and derivatives. It, it is true that it, it has become a self-fulfilling self prophecy. Right. But it's also been very important in why the government has intervened to, uh, to protect uh, Bear Stearns and, and other, other dealers. Right. Yeah. Well, you, you know, these topics, uh, if, uh, a year ago or two years ago, they would have seemed uh, a lot like inside baseball and who really cares. Exactly. But it turns out that these things that are somewhat arcane uh, in concept have tremendous public policy issues uh, it, it, behind them and really affect uh, all of our lives as we're seeing these days. So I, I want to thank you, Rob, for uh, joining us. I really appreciate that. And I also want to thank our audience for having been with us today. So thank you very much. My pleasure. Thank you.